Welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week, we are looking at the economic jigsaw puzzle. Economics isn't necessarily the most interesting place to play, but it's crucial to truly understand. In this session, we'll break apart all of the key components so you can be better informed and make higher probability, higher profitable trading and investing decisions. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and of course, co-host, Mitch Laurentiu. G'day buddy, how are you? G'day, Mr. Baxter. Good to be here, buddy, as virtual as we are. Good to see you. It's been a long time and some interesting picks behind the wall there. You've been on the road by the looks of it, buddy. <laughs> yeah, days of old when we're allowed to be out and about meeting people. Obviously, uh, like so many of us, I'm in lockdown, albeit here in Byron Bay. And uh, here we are at home, homeschooling, got four kids under six, another baby due imminently, and uh, life, is, uh, life is peachy. <laughs> You're a busy man at the best of times, I can only imagine. Hopefully you're entertaining those kids with a jigsaw puzzle or two, which happens to be our topic of conversation of today. The worst segue of all time, the economic <laughs> jigsaw puzzle that is our economy right now. Plenty to digest. And as an economist by trade, I know we're all dying to hear your thoughts. That has to be a gold medal winning segue. That's probably the worst I've heard from you this year. So why don't I take the accolade? That's right. The, uh, the jigsaw puzzle of economics. Yeah, more often than not, most people have heard little snippets of different statistics or facts and figures or seen things on the news. And piecing them all together is really what successful investing has to be about, understanding how uh, the, the, the economic jigsaw puzzle works. And I guess to take a step back, most people are pretty familiar with the jigsaw puzzle. You lay all the pieces out, uh, you, know, you put in the corners and boundaries, and then you flesh the whole thing out. But it's very, very hard if you haven't had the opportunity to look at the picture, uh, which is, of course, on the cover of the box. So hopefully uh, today we're able to show you what that cover of the box looks like so that you've got something to aim at. And I think that's the challenge that many people are facing right now, how people feel and what the numbers are suggesting are two very different stories. Anecdotally, AB, I think a probably a good place to start would be your kind of fundamental analysis overarching the economy as it stands right now, where do you see things sitting? Look, I think we're actually at a, at a major crossroads right now. And depending on policy from particularly a central bank, um, we could go one of two ways. One is a little bit of a rocky path that leads to a good place. Or one might seem to be a smoother path right now that leads to financial genocide. So that's my opinion for what it's worth. And I guess we'll explore both of those as we uh, as we go through this. And you know, the critical fact that we're talking about here, of course, is actually interest rates. Um, yeah, we're in times now where we've got the lowest interest rates uh, in history in Australia. 0.1% is our current base rate. And we're in a, an economy where... Lower interest rates, just for the benefit of everybody, means that borrowing money is cheap. You know, you think about for every million dollars you buy, it's costing you maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year in interest. So, every million you borrow, it's only costing you twenty or thirty grand to service. If you can put that million into an investment that's outperforming twenty or thirty grand a year, uh, then your, your streets ahead. Hence, why people are borrowing, uh, particularly to get into the investment property space. But there is a challenge with that, and that's what happens when interest rates start to move up. And there's a lot of conjecture out there at the moment, oh, we're going to go to negative interest rates and so on. But the big challenge that we're facing is that our cost of living, what we call inflation, CPI uh, being the, uh, the uh, acronym that's often used to describe it, uh, is really starting to gain some momentum. 3.8% right now here in Australia has been an awful long time since we've seen that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big number and it doesn't look like it's going to get any better. And I know you and I have spoken previously about for example, the wealth effect where property prices go up, everyone feels richer and therefore more confident. However, if inflation keeps running rampant, AB, the solution to that is obviously to increase interest rates, but what kind of effect would that actually have on our economy? Look, look, massive. Um, you know, the, at the moment, we've got a runaway property market, which is on an absolute tear. And it's on a tear purely and simply because the cost of borrowing money is so, so low. And if that rate starts to move higher, yeah, that underpins the whole argument for owning property. We'll dive into some of the numbers around property in a moment. But for anybody that's perhaps tuned into this going, well, you know, 3.8% inflation, I don't actually believe that's an accurate number for a few reasons. And, and, and look, if you're someone at home that does grocery shopping, you know, week in, week out, groceries have been getting uh, increasingly expensive. Filling your car with fuel has been getting increasingly expensive. Your electricity bill, admittedly, most people are spending more time at home now given you know, the various health constraints we're living under. Electricity bills are creeping up. Private health cover, 8% jump for the first half of this year. So the nuts and bolts expenses that people are exposed to are ratcheting up at really quite an alarming rate. And 
given the issues we're seeing globally with supply chains, particularly transport is a huge one um, that at the moment is largely being borne by retailers. But just to give you an idea, yes, that's all one of the statistics yesterday, Mitch, and the cost of a shipping container, moving a shipping container around is four times more expensive than what it was this time last year. So those costs are going to get passed on, which does result in more and more inflationary pressure for people. And a lot of households are truly struggling to make ends meet. There was a survey yesterday, MeBank, ME Bank, uh, which is yeah, predominantly in Melbourne, but has also got some other exposure on the Eastern Seaboard. Now part, of course, of Bank of Queensland, a great merger or acquisition that took place a few months ago. Uh, and the survey that they showed, and these figures are absolutely startling, 20% um, of the households and families surveyed had less than $1,000 in savings. And it shows how many people are living really week to week in an environment where it's getting more expensive to live week to week. And of course, the antidote for that is higher wages and that ain't happening. Totally, and just to add to that, I've done some research myself for the month of July, fuel prices in Australia rose 6.4% just that month. Uh, healthcare, two and a half percent for the month of July as well. In your opinion, what, what do you think the real rate of inflation might be? Look, I think if you, if you look at the basket that's contained in CPI versus the, the world that we live in, I think you'd be looking at a figure that's probably closer to 5% uh, to, to 6%, something in that sort of order. And, and the challenge where this really comes back to hit, as I say, number one, there's really no scope for wage growth because you know, the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia, have said, look, they, they don't plan on um, in, increasing interest rates until inflation gets, uh, gets up and running, which it already is. And we start to see unemployment at those sort of 4% levels because that will cause wage growth, which will enable people to you know, expand their lifestyle in a rising interest rate environment. The challenge is unemployment right now is 4.6%, according to the official figure. But that figure, again, is one which I don't necessarily believe is that relevant because real unemployment, let's just talk about this for a moment. Unemployment is based on people that are actively seeking work. And there are an enormous number of people who have just opted out and gone, it's just too hard at the moment. I'm not even gonna bother looking for work. So they're not counted in those unemployment figure uh, figures that we see. Also someone that maybe is working one hour a week or even zero hours a week right now is not considered unemployed within that figure. So when you've got um, you know, an artificially low unemployment rate there, you, you, you're not gonna see the wage growth that people are expecting. And, and, and let's face it from an employer perspective, and don't get me started on this one, but your, your cost for employees has actually gone up because as of 1st of July, the contribution that you need to make to your employee super has increased by a couple of percent, which is effectively a couple of percent pay rise to the employee. The employee doesn't see that because they don't have the cash in their pocket this week to pay for their groceries. It's gone into their super, but as an employer, what you're paying your staff per hour has now increased. So there's effectively been a wage, uh, wage jump internally for the business. RBA's got a really difficult decision, Mitch, because if you compare it to, you know, and, and no politics in this statement at all, um, you know, the New South Wales government very clearly should have been much more vigorous on implementing a lockdown in Sydney very, very early on, weeks if not months ago now, to prevent the in interstate and cross-state uh, spreading of COVID. And because they didn't take that firm action then, we'll just have like a mock down. People are still going out for a latte uh, while they're pretending to exercise on their walk around the beach, you know, and now we've seen what the consequences that are for everybody living in New South Wales. Um, had they have taken a firmer line two months ago, we wouldn't have the situation which is, you know, toxic with what over a thousand new cases today, for example. In just the same way, the RBA, if they're to make a move on interest rates now, it's going to be unpalatable and it's going to unsettle things a little bit and certainly take some heat out of the property market. But if you don't take action now and you let inflation get to five, six percent, you won't be moving interest rates by, you know, a quarter of a point. You'll need to move them by two or three percent in order to rein in inflation, which effectively will kill any economic growth that we're seeing right now. So it's a very difficult decision. And you've got to take um, as uh, again, without being too political, I think the biography is up behind me. Margaret Thatcher's uh, great comments in 1979. You may not like the taste of the medicine, but it will keep the patient alive. And that's exactly the dilemma that the Reserve Bank of Australia is really facing right now is needing to put the medicine out there, which is high higher interest rates, um, it's not going to want to do it, but it really needs to to keep that inflation figure under control. Great analogy, the famous Margaret Thatcher. And I think the, the yeah. lockdowns in Sydney is, is almost a proxy for what inflation could be, you know, treating it as a, as a mockdown and then the cat getting out of the bag, it's, you're on the back foot. Inflation is most likely probably heading the same way. 
Now, as we know, AB, the RBA's sole goal is to manage interest rates and therefore inflation, not keep the property market afloat. However, it almost appears that that's kind of the mode of operation at this point. Can't make any, well, any facts of statement there, but nonetheless, you get what I mean. Well, pro property is such a huge component. I mean, you know, we've got 66% of our population are homeowners in terms of a primary place of residence, and then there are people that invest on the back of it. And we've seen a huge surge in household debt. Um, you know, if you look at household debt over the last 30 years, it's tripled. Um, if we look at the amount of um, loans that are out there just over the last three years, there's a further, um, something in the order of about 11 billion dollars in loans for, 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 for primary price residents, much more, of course, in the investment space. So people have really geared up because rates are low and they were told by the RBA, we won't be touching rates till 2024. Very foolish, and I've commented on this plenty of times, very foolish promise to make. You never make promises you've got no ability to keep. And if inflation keeps rising, they're gonna to have to move early. Yet all those people that believed the story that there won't be a rate rise till 2024 are gonna get carted by that. Um, you know, and if you think if your household budget is really stretched right now, um, you know, having to pay out an extra, okay, it may not seem that much. Oh, it's costing me an extra $200 a month on my mortgage, but that $200 needs to come from somewhere and you're getting nothing further to show for it. So, you know, that is a very, very scary prospect. And the reason I think that there's maybe been a little bit more leniency towards our property sector is because, you know, construction and, 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 as a, and property itself are two huge components. Construction, one of the biggest employers in the country, and certainly a major asset for economic management in terms of the multiplier effect, throw some subsidy at construction, and it has an impact of about seven or eight times every dollar of subsidy that's put in there because of employees, supply chains, and so on and so forth. And that overall wealth effect of people's house going up in value, they feel more affluent and they spend. And that's why you know we've seen you know, consumer spending basically just go ballistic, which is why we've got a level of inflation too. Yeah, you look at the results from companies like Harvey Norman, JB Hi-Fi, Temple and Webster. Um, you know, they've all come out with bumper numbers because people are spending because they feel more affluent. Try buying a car right now. The wait lists are incredible. So that growth in the value of the property and the ability to suck equity out of it to spend, again, has been a big, big catalyst for our economic recovery. However, that can't go on forever. You know, it's past the parcel. You don't want to be holding that parcel when the music stops. It appears that the music may have stopped even just for the moment for businesses and we can talk about business confidence ab that's come off the boil and how can you blame them because there's snap lockdowns and there's no certainty whatsoever in the kind of landscape we're operating in what kind of effect does a lack of business confidence have on our economy as we move forward it's massive and it's on all levels um, of business, whether you're a, uh, an owner operator or, or whether you're a big multinational, it is a, an enormous issue. Um, you know, consumer confidence certainly has come off the ball because I think people have realized, um, you know, there's no JobKeeper 2, for example. Um, and, and so all of a sudden that certainty of the future has gone in. But let's talk about business confidence and how hard it is. Um, you know, a, a good buddy of mine um, is a lettuce farmer uh, here in Byron, lovely guy, and, um, and a great product, I might add. And the challenge that he has right now is that all the restaurants that he supplies are closed. Now, there are no cases of COVID up here, but nonetheless, everything is locked down because it's a statewide attempt to fix a problem that could have been contained. Let's not go back to that. Now, in his situation, he, if the green light is given on the weekend and lockdown is eased and restaurants are able to open, what does he do? Does he, does he, does he plant more lettuce now that are going to be harvested in seven weeks? Or does he, in seven weeks' time, realise restaurants are still closed and plough those back into the ground? Or does he just hold off until such times as everything's back up and running and then he's unable to supply his customers for seven weeks anyway? Now, that's a very simple business. It grows lettuce, it sells it to restaurants. Yet the moving parts of that, based on the uncertainty that's been created by the economic conditions we're in right now, has hammered his confidence. Now, if you think about the knock-on effects within his household, you know, if you're thinking of making a decision to buy a new car, that's a decision you're almost certainly going to put off because you don't know what your cash flow is going to be like, because you don't even know if you're going to be selling a product to somebody in seven weeks. You don't know if you're going to uh, do some renovations on your house because you don't know what your income flow is going to be like. And that has knock-on effects in other sectors. So this uncertainty is massive, and it's going to be a very, very difficult um, ship to turn around, just given the size uh, of the economy that we're in. Very, very, very difficult times, and markets 
and, econom and economies hate uncertainty and we're in unprecedented times right now of massive levels of uncertainty which make planning and, and having any kind of game plan virtually impossible to implement. It's a really, really challenging time and that business and consumer confidence is extraordinarily shaky right now. Gotcha. Some great points in there. But as one great man once said, with challenges comes opportunity. And we can talk about the pieces of the puzzle to the economy. But what about forming a game plan, AB? As we come to the end of this broadcast, what's your advice to our listeners here to, I guess, foolproof themselves, not bury their head in the sand in what's to come, but actually get up and get ahead? Yeah, look, there's always an opportunity in anything. You've just got to be looking through the right lenses, Mitch. And, you know, you're either a positive or a negative person. It boils down to that. And I'm very minded that, you know, this particular podcast does seem to be quite negative. And, and it's not by design. It's just spelling out the facts as they stand. It's far less rosy than people would, would like to have. Just to give you an idea, I heard this statistic this morning. And this, again, talk about consumer debt. If we look at buy now, pay later, 20% of online sales in Australia are undertaken using buy now, pay later. It's 2% elsewhere in the world. So that shows you how much we've come to rely in our online transactions, which is most transactions in the current circumstance on that. And there's another slab of debt that's albeit off the balance sheet that's over there. So yeah, there's some, you know, there's some big challenges coming. So where is the opportunity in this? Really simple. You know, most people right now, are, are, are sort of floundering, you know, what are we going to do? The economy is changing. How do we pivot? How do we get ourselves in the right place for this? And the answer is you need to do something because whatever was working for you before may continue to work, but it may not. So if you're a, very much a one-eyed investor and we'll look at the different asset classes, let's say, for example, you're a property investor. The commercial reasons for owning a property right now, and we've, we've covered this previously, uh, are non-existent. The only reason to own an investment property, if you're buying now or anywhere in the next 18 months, is to see a rise in the value of that property because the actual rental return on that property is so paper thin, it just simply doesn't stack up. It, it makes no sense from a commercial basis. So, you know, if you're thinking about diving into that property market right now, um, you know, I'd be very, very careful and really evaluate the numbers as to what you're doing because it is a very toppy market. Valuations are hugely overstretched and there's no chance that wages are going to grow to anything like a level to get yields, rental yields back up to what would be considered a commercial level. If you're a stock market investor, you know, it's been quite an interesting result season. We've seen companies like CBA, um, BHP, um, NIB, Health Cover, uh, Zip, all come out with record numbers uh, for different reasons. And where companies have come out with very, very strong profits, we've often seen the share price drop quite considerably, which seems a little unusual. Um, and, and that would wrong foot a lot of investors. And part of the reason for that is their outlook and guidance, as we've talked of in this session, just using lettuce farming as an example, are a little bit shaky and opaque. In fact, some companies aren't even coming out with guidance because it's very hard. And, and so for a stock market investor that's buy and hold, that's actually quite tricky. You can go, oh, it'll even itself out over time. Maybe it will. But I think you can be far more proactive in that. And what we've been running very, very successfully for our clients you know, over two decades now, but not just the last two decades, Decades, particularly so um, through this COVID crisis, is the ability to be nimble and to have strategies that are based over a shorter time frame. I'm not talking about day trading, that's a waste of time. We've covered that in previous um, podcasts, as you can see. But to have shorter time frames, because it's, it's hard to predict the future in three or six months' time, at least three or six days, you can get a little bit of a gauge on what's going to go on. And we've certainly got strategies that can do that. More importantly, and, and the motivation for people here, Mitch, and this is the crucial thing, it's not what to do, it's why. Because if you've got a big enough why, you'll get it done. Having a job is no longer a given. Okay, job security is gone, particularly in this current economy. And having a second form of income for a lot of people has often seemed like a luxury. The reality is it is a necessity now. And if you're going to look at an investment process that gives you income, you're not going to get any income out of an investment property. The yield is too low and you run the risk of an interest rate rise, which will absorb any income you're getting from it anyway. Dividends on shares can be taken away, as we saw last year. If you invest in shares purely for the dividend, you only get a check twice a year. It's going to be somewhere between 3 and 5% for the year. Take out inflation at the official level of 3.8. You're making 1% before tax. It's crazy. So you need something that's going to outperform all that, which is what we do. But more importantly, you need something that's going to be able to manage and contain risk. Because these are times, I think, where just certainly in the next few months, I deem it as being risk on. That doesn't mean to say run for the hills and don't advance, invest. It means be very minded of being able to manage the risk around your investments so that you can not only survive, but thrive through these times. 
And what an interesting jigsaw puzzle we have deciphered here, AB. I guess that picture of what we would ideally like to see uh, is getting a little bit murky, but I'm glad that we've been able to pull together the strings here to be able to give our listeners a, a nice kind of clear cut analysis on that. And the message is always simple. Get yourself invested and make sure that you're managing your risk because if things do get a little bit shaky out there, you want to make sure that that secondary income is, uh, is on its right, on its way. Too true. And, 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 and the key thing with that kind of investing is don't get emotional about it. Look at the hard numbers. Yeah, the numbers are going to give you the ability to make an objective decision. And we've talked about a lot of numbers here. You know, we've talked about wage growth, which is about you know, 1.8% of inflation. That's triple that. We've talked about unemployment, which is being understated right now. We've got interest rates at 0.1%. There's a lot of numbers in here. Bottom line is they're just like looking at the speedometer in your car. They're only a number. You can look at the speedometer in your car and it could say 60 kilometers an hour. And you say, great, I'm driving at 60 kilometers an hour. That's an okay speed. It's not too fast. But if it's 8.30 in the morning and you're going through a school zone and you know that because you've looked out of the window and gone, oh, this is a place where I need to be driving much more slowly. That's where looking out the window and understanding not just what the number is, but what it actually means in the context of what's going on is crucial. And by going through you know, the economic jigsaw puzzle, hopefully that's given our audience the ability to get a bit more sense around not just the numbers, but what they actually mean and why they're important to understand. Great advice, AB. Thank you very much. Plenty to digest in that and some really good content for our listeners there. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Anytime, Mitch. There you have it, guys. Make sure you share this with your friends and family so we can get the message out there. Give us a review and a rating and we'll see you next week.